Let's look at our scripture today, and we are reading from a slightly different version than we normally read. It is correct on the screen. The words of Jesus will be in, in, in the same color as the rest of the text, which is a little bit different for us. So please follow along. It's kind of lengthy, so please help us read together. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias and showed in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in at the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Fend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said this to him the third time. Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God. So again, we are pleased to have Reverend Jim Barnett. He is our conference district superintendent present our message. Good morning. This is actually the third time that I have had the opportunity to preach to you. Once before in person, and the second time was online. So I don't know how many people tuned in to catch that. Uh, it is good to be here in person with you this morning. I invite you to join with me in a word of prayer.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, you who are our strength and redeemer. Picture it, if you will, in your mind's eye. It's early morning, just shortly after dawn. There is a group of men seated around a small fire, enjoying what I'm going to guess was probably a fairly quiet breakfast of fish and bread. And then three of the men stand up, and they, they proceed to walk along the lake shore. Two of those men walk side by side. The third individual is just a few steps behind following. Of course, the two who are walking side by side are Jesus and Peter. And the third man walking just behind them, it is speculated that he is John, the brother of James, one of the sons of Zebedee. As Jesus and Peter walk along the shoreline, Jesus looks to Peter and he says to him, he says to him, Peter, do you love me? Now, Simon, Peter, responds. He says, yes, Lord, I love you. Now, that's what we see in the English. If we, if we look at this text in the Greek, we see there's a little more going on here than, than what meets the eye. Jesus says to Peter, he says, Peter, do you agapas me? Now, agapas is taken from, its root word is from the Greek word agape. You and I are very familiar probably with the word agape. It is, in, in the Greek language, there's various words for love. And we just translate all of them into the one word, love. But agape is that type of love which is totally self-giving, entirely not self-centered. It's an all-in love, no matter what the cost. So Jesus says to Peter, Peter, Simon, do you agapes? me. And Peter replies to Jesus, he says, well, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But when you read that in the Greek, Peter responds to Jesus, not with agapo, but he says, Lord, I, I phileo you, which comes from the Greek word philia which means we're best buds. It's a brotherly love. You and I are copacetic, Jesus. But you see, it's not the same love. Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me with an all-in love that's willing to sacrifice anything and everything? And, and Peter says, well, Jesus, you know we're best buddies. <laughs> We're best of friends. And of course, Jesus responds, feed my lambs. They walk a little further down the shoreline, and Jesus looks to Peter once again, and he says, he says, Peter, do you agapes me? And again, Peter replies, Lord, I phileo you. Peter, do you love me with a love beyond all condition, a willingness to fully give yourself to me and my cause? Well, Jesus, you know we're best buddies. 
They walk a little further down the shoreline, and yet a third time, much to Peter's disappointment, Jesus asks him one more time, Peter, do you love me? But this time, Jesus meets Peter at his level of love. And Jesus says to Simon Peter, he says, do you agapes me? And Peter says, Lord, you know everything. You know. You know that you and I are best buddies. Now, it's interesting to see how, how Jesus has transitioned here. You know, there are, there are some theologians who will say, uh, well, Peter denied Jesus three times, and uh, now it's kind of Peter's opportunity to balance the sheet and to express his love for Jesus three times. I think that might be a rather simplistic view, especially when you look at it in the Greek. It's interesting to note here that, that Jesus finally goes ahead and meets Peter where he is, knowing full well, as the scriptures reflect, that eventually Peter will reach this point of agape love, being bound and led where he would not go on his own volition in yielding his life as a martyr to the cause of the kingdom of God. But those are words. And I may have even in the past preached a sermon or two focused on the words agape and agapos. Well, I didn't say that right now, did I? I'm just seeing if you're listening. <laughs> a sermon focused on the words agape and philia. But to focus on the words here is to miss the whole point of this transaction between Peter and Jesus. It's not about words. It's about actions. It's about actions. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. You see, if we, if we focus here on just the words, we miss the whole point of how Jesus is calling Peter. It doesn't really matter what level of love Peter has for Jesus. What's important to Jesus is that Peter hears Jesus' call to take care of his lambs, take care of his sheep. Now, Someone might ask, what does it mean to feed the sheep, to tend the lambs, to, to tend the sheep? I can't really think of a better place to look in Scripture, to come to an understanding of, of what it means to have faith in action. Remember this whole exchange between Jesus and Peter isn't about the level of love, it's about the action which is subsequent to that love. Can't think of a better place to look for an understanding than Matthew, the 25th chapter. Now, if you recall, in the 25th chapter of the gospel, according to St. Matthew, Jesus is telling a parable where, if you will, he paints a picture for the listeners, a picture of what is often referred to as the last judgment. And in this, in this parable, Jesus outlines what it means to be in the kingdom. Outlines what, what it means to be in the kingdom and, and what it means to be out of the kingdom. Now, since we're live and on TV... I'm not going to go down into the crowd and, and do the Phil Donahue. Now, some of you who are younger have no idea who Phil Donahue is, but most of us do. I go out, out in the crowd with a microphone and, and get your responses for, for what, you th what you feel are the, the defining characteristics of being in the kingdom or being out of the kingdom. Now, as you sit there, just think a minute about things you've been told about what it means to be in the kingdom. I've actually been in situations uh, on a Sunday morning where, where I've asked people, 
Well, what do you think it means to be in the kingdom? What are the defining characteristics? I'll just, I'll just list a few of them for you. Some people will say, well, in order to be in the kingdom of God, uh, you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ and have asked him into your heart and repented of your sins. You do that and you're in the kingdom. Some will say, well, if you're, if you're really in the kingdom, you must believe that, that um, um, Jesus died for your sins and accept that death to compensate for your sins. Some will say, well, in order to be in the kingdom, you have to be baptized the right way. Some of you may have had conversations with uh, some of your fellow Christians where there's a conversation about the right way to be baptized. We Methodists don't qualify. Uh, we, we pour water, we sprinkle, and if you really insist on it, we'll find a pool or a pond and we'll immerse you. But that's also one of the characteristics people talk about. If you're really a Christian, if you're in the kingdom, you will have been baptized in a certain way. If not, you're not in the kingdom. I've also heard uh, people talk about uh, membership in a church. Well, if you're really in the kingdom of God, you'll be a member of a church. And sometimes they'll get very specific about what type of church that is. Some people will even say, well, in order to be in the kingdom, you have to believe um, in the authority of Scripture. It's interesting that currently in our United Methodist Church family, we're having this big argument. And there's this understand, there is this thought out there um, regarding the authority of Scripture. But what really is being debated isn't the authority of Scripture, for all United Methodists believe in the authority of Scripture. What's currently being debated is the authority of someone's interpretation of Scripture. That's what we're squaring off with each other against not the authority of scripture but the interpretation of someone's the authority of someone's interpretation of scripture so anyway, all these things are listed as things which are characteristics or signs of whether or not a person is in the kingdom but i find it intriguing that if we read matthew 25 none of these things are listed do you remember what the defining characteristics are of a person who is in the kingdom and a person who is not in the kingdom, as is depicted in Matthew 25. I encourage you to go home this afternoon and read Matthew 25, verses 31 and following, to kind of refresh your memory, but I'll read you just a part of it. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. You see, Jesus in Matthew 25, in, in telling this parable about the last judgment, says that the defining characteristic of a person who is in the kingdom versus a person who is not in the kingdom has nothing to do with words, has nothing to do with beliefs, has nothing to do with doctrines, but has everything to do with how we interact with the people around us day by day. What does it mean to tend lambs? What does it mean to feed lambs? What does it mean to feed sheep? 
Well, I would submit to you that as Jesus told the disciples just a few days prior to this, he says, as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And if you look at one of Peter's early sermons, he tells you about Jesus being baptized and how he went about preaching the kingdom and doing good works. I'll even refer you to the Sermon on the Mount. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You see, so much of how we talk about Christianity in our current context has to do with membership and doctrines and beliefs. But you'll notice Jesus in this parable in Matthew 25 doesn't say that the king sitting upon the, on his throne says, all of you that have been immersed over here and all of you that have not over here. He doesn't say all of you who are Protestants over here and all of you who are Roman Catholic over here. In fact, he doesn't say all of you who are Christians over here and all of you who are Buddhist and Muslims and, and Hindus and atheists and agnostics over here. He doesn't say those of you who believe literally in the Bible over here and those of you who do not believe literally in the Bible over here or those of you who have this interpretation of Scripture over here and those of you who have this interpretation of Scripture over here. What Jesus says is that the mark of being a person who is in the kingdom, the mark of a person who is a Christian, is a person who shows compassionate, loving kindness to the people with whom they engage on a daily basis. Do you remember that hymn that was very popular in the 60s? Maybe it wasn't so much a hymn at that time as it was just a, a kind of a gospel song. They'll know we are Christians by what? By our love. It's not they'll know we are Christians by the type of baptism we practice. It's not that they will know we are Christians based on how we interpret Scripture. It's not they will know we are Christians because we are members of a church. It's not they will know that, that we are Christians because um, we hold a certain set of doctrines and beliefs. No. They will know that we are Christians by our love. Even the, the, God, the New Testament writer of John talks about um, his statement that God is love. If a man says that he loves God but hates his neighbor, he's a liar. It's very clear that the sign of being a person who follows Jesus, remember, after he asks these three questions, Jesus says to Peter, follow me. And we, as disciples have said that we will follow Jesus. There's another old song. I have decided what? You remember that one? I have decided to, to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus is to love. To follow Jesus isn't about words. It's about actions. To follow Jesus is in all of our interactions with people every day to love, to be compassionate, to be kind, to be caring, to be gentle. May God give to you and me the grace to follow Jesus in steps and actions of love. Amen.